Hello, I'm David Hoffman, filmmaker, and I'm about to show you a clip of a 98-year-old woman who I interviewed back in 1979. So she was born in 1881. She's just as colorful and alive as she could be. So what's the circumstance? I'm doing a film, a major special for public television called The Information Society. It's a completely new idea. Nobody had ever heard of it. We're still in the industrial age in 1979. Yet computers are moving into banks and stores and not yet homes too much, but into people's lives. So I go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That's the place I pick. It's got some small cities. It's got some rural people. And I start talking to people about the coming of the information age and about the lives that they lived in before even cars and telephones. And this lady, 98 years old, remembers everything. Now, what you're seeing is a work print. I found this piece of film in my basement in a can, didn't know what it was, digitized it, and I find her. You're gonna see blotches and marks and scratches. Why? Because it's 16 millimeter work print. It's all I have. I wish I had more. And some of my questions are just plain dumb. I'm looking at this biggest story, the information age and the industrial age. And here I'm talking to a woman who remembers so much she could have talked to me for hours and I should have done that, but I didn't. And in those days, I threw out the outtakes. Take a look at this. I think you'll enjoy it. 98 years old, 1979. What do you want her for? I thought she'd gone put her in the picture. No, no, just to be someone to listen to you to help make it more comfortable. Of course, I wasn't born until 81, you know. And he, there was a long period before that. And they... Those uh, iron works were run for quite a number of years. And then the steel came in and they couldn't compete with them. Of course, uh, the people in the county didn't come to Lancaster like they would today because uh, the transportation was difficult. We had a little road, uh, railroad that ran from Lancaster down to Quarryville. And uh, I think the train left Quarryville at uh, 7 o'clock, something like that, and it took us about three hours to get up. To <laughs> we stopped at every station, you know, with uh, either to take on something. Well, going back, it was always to put something off and to... Uh, had come up why uh, we'd stop to pick things up to bring to Lancaster, the freight. And sometimes we'd stop at a station and the hall, they'd go back and look for it. And maybe we'd spend 15 minutes or half an hour getting ready to leave. <laughs> and uh, in the wintertime, uh, the, you almost prayed for snow because then you had... Uh, the sleigh, and it was much easier to get around in a sleigh. What about um, uh, communication between people then? How did, how did, how much did everybody know? How did you get your information then? How, how Why, you writing know? letters. And my grandfather, that was the one thing in his life I don't think ever miss, miss getting the mail every day. And we had to go two, uh, two miles and a half to get the mail. And as, as a child, that was one of my chores. And uh, I either rode horseback or I had a little two-wheeled uh, car. It, looks like a, it looked like a racer. You know, it had a step at the back. And that's the way you got in. And, of course, when the, <laughs> when the horse trapped, we trotted with it, you know. <laughs> and in wintertime, that was all right in summertime, but in wintertime, and we had a, a big, old, great big buffalo robe to wrap yourself in to keep warm. Was mail as good a, a method of communication today? Uh, Let's say, compare those days with the present in terms of how people heard about things. Oh, well, we had what the stagecoach would come from. It came from Lancaster right down, went from Lancaster down, I think it went as far as, I don't know, Fairfield, Peace Bottom. It went down, 
and it was supposed to get, I think, to the buck at 11 o'clock. And uh, it usually got there at half past 12. <laughs> you sat and waited. And of course, the, when the telephone rang, the whole neighborhood went to listen to what. And that, a great deal of news got around that way. Oh, the people were full of that. They could, uh, and some, sometimes the people would be listening to the phone. They'd get excited. They'd join in the conversation. <laughs> I think it was about 1928, I got a radio, and uh, it sat right here. And I don't know, what, no, I guess none of you remember one man's family, but there was a story, one man's family, and it ran for, I don't know how many years, 20 or 30 years, I think. And I remember distinctly it came on just about dinner time. A little after, and uh, how we would rush sometimes if it was a special time, we rush from the dinner table to get in to hear the the story of one man's family, and you know it never ended, and that I that was one thing I never liked to listen to something that don't end, and as a rule, when people came to make to stay with you, they brought a great deal of luggage with them, <laughs> and they stayed at least two weeks. <laughs> Nobody ever would ever think of coming and spending the weekend that was just out. And uh, of course, grandfather always sent the horse, the carriage for the guests, and then they uh, sent a something else to carry the luggage. What is your opinion about all this, uh, the modern what? communications like telephone, television, uh, satellite, uh, uh, the way that we now deal with each other? How do you feel about the modern way of communicating? Well, I, it, it's a wonderful world to live in today, but uh, I don't think we're any happier. I'm, I'm not any happier than I was in those days. Of course, I, in those days, I thought I had everything that everybody I had. I thought I had a little more than everybody else had because I really had no cares at all. And uh, at that time, you, it wasn't difficult to get anybody to help. In my youth, <laughs> I had no worries. And... Uh, for everybody, for this uh, well, and I think, well, everybody was friendly. Everybody knew everybody else, and uh, it was a, it was a, it was a nice life. It was a good life. Of course, it was a, there was a great deal of family life, I would say. And in terms of the now, um, it's it, it's all, it's so different now. Because the, the family life isn't what it used to be. As uh, the children grow up, they want to, well, they, they seek more independence, I suppose. And, uh, yes, they do. They want to be independent. I don't know whether it's wrong or right. And uh, there are loads of marvelous people living. So you're an but person. but I, I'm most interested in the youth of today because they're the people that are going to carry on this country, this nation. And I want them to hold their patriotism and love the country like the old fellows did like our ancestors did. Because everything you got in the world, I don't care what you say, depends on what kind of people you have at the head of your government. Mrs. Souter, why don't you start by telling me about your grandfather and what 
life was like for a man in the in the height of the industrial age. The you know, those old iron masters were sort of kings. They uh, ruled the roost, as the, as the boys would say. <laughs> But uh, they helped develop the country because I know down at home they made the uh, rails for the B and O railroad, and in the Civil War they made cannon for the army, the other army, and uh, was it a, was and it then a they made stoves, the ten old tin plate stoves. Was it an active time here in, in the city? At the time when there was a lot of industry, describe when you were a child, what it was like. Was it a flourishing? Well, it was a flourishing town, and it was the center of Lancashire County. It was a great thing to come to Lancashire. Everybody thought it was, yes, they were very proud of it at that time. Oh. All right, let me ask you again. Um, the that Lancaster has changed in terms of the way the city communicates with the world. Right now, for example, you know, and everyone else in town knows pretty much what's happening everywhere. Yeah. Could you tell Excuse me, about me. I had to do it. Between 60 years ago and today, in terms of this being a provincial place versus a part of the whole country and a part of everything, really. Yeah. Tell me about that. How you've seen that change take place. A small town life to a... More yes, I've seen it. When I came here to live, I think there were three automobiles in town. And uh, it is built up now that I think almost everybody has an automobile. And uh, it used to be, of course, the, the motor uh, conveyance at the time I came here was uh, we had a railroad that went ran from here from Halfway from Pittsburgh through to New York and uh, outside of that and then we developed a uh, the trolleys. We had a marvelous trolley system here in the early 1900s, from 1901 to about, well, I don't, 19, well, the Depression Was began. New York and Philadelphia and Boston as close a place as it is now, or did it seem far away then? Well, it was far away. When you went to those places, you thought you were going to take a trip. You were really going places. And uh, now, going to Boston, somebody gets on a plane and they're there in a couple hours. I went to Boston on my wedding trip. And I, oh boy, it was quite a trip. I thought I had quite a trip. <laughs> and uh, yes, travel at that time. And as for going south, well, what about hearing about things? Now, let's say some news occurred in Florida or something like that today. How was the difference then in terms of the news versus how it is today in terms of your getting the information about the world? Well, uh, to go to Florida, that was, uh, that, I think that was a three-day trip. No, so, I mean in terms of news. Hmm? If something happened in Florida yes. then and something happened in Florida today, what is the difference in terms of the way you got the information about what was happening? Well, you, you, you got the information, I would presume, at that time. Of course, I must confess, at that time, I wasn't paying much attention to things of that sort. <laughs> but looking back over, I would say you would. It was the through the newspapers, and I, I suppose the newspapers got us through telegrams and things of that sort. I wouldn't know how else they would get us. I don't know. We didn't have any uh, telephones early. We, When I left the country, uh, when in 1901, 
We didn't have a telephone. No, we didn't. We didn't have a telephone. What but difference there, there was all a telephone. Hmm? What difference has all that telephone and all the other stuff made? What is the difference? Oh, it's made, uh, of course, the population wasn't at that time anything like it was now. When they first got the telephone, my, uh, my uncle took over the homestead after grandma, my grandmother died, and he lived there, and he uh, had the telephone set up, and of course he, he they had a main line, a line that went down through the, the old, I have to say it, the old Lancaster Road, and I don't know what number it is now, and uh, he had to build a line in from that line to his house. And then he had so many rings, and of course, when the telephone rang, the whole neighborhood went to listen. 